thinking that Jason was looking over my shoulder on my computer this week uh, with the songs that were selected. Uh, it's something that I really wasn't certain if I was going to be preaching this message or I, I had a, two or three running through my head and you all know me when my get things going in my head you don't know, know what direction they're going to go but God started dealing with me really about this I guess last Friday not this past Friday but the Friday before and if you have Bibles you can uh, turn if you will to the uh, 90th Psalm uh, this is something that has been heavy on me over the last couple of weeks. It's something that made me really think. And actually, I guess it started a couple of weeks before that, but it really started hitting home. In Psalms 90, there are just a couple of verses I want to read, and then uh, we'll get started here. The days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength they are 80 years, Yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger for the fear of you? For as the fear of you, so is your wrath. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Father, we ask that you add blessing to the reading of your word. And now, Lord, we pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit on the words of this message, that they become your words, words of life and encouragement, words of authority, of power, words of instruction, rebuke. Father, whatever it is that we stand in need of today, I pray that this word would become that. Open our hearts to receive it, Lord, and not just hear this word, but act upon it. And Father, as always, I pray, don't let me get in the way. In Jesus' name, amen. Now this psalm was written by Moses just right after the exodus from Egypt. And uh, when you read the whole thing, you begin to see uh, some certain things in there. You see how timeless God really is, and you see how frail we really are. And we see that we need to submit to God's judgment. And then there's a prayer for mercy in this psalm. See, Israel had been sentenced to wander because they wouldn't obey God. Israel had wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years until a whole generation died off. And I want you to think about that. Anyone from 20 years old and up, the scriptures say, didn't get to go to the promised land, except for Joshua and Caleb. They were the only old guys there. They had wandered around day after day, day after day, watching people dying. Knowing that one day they would get to go to the promised land. They knew that promise was there. They knew that they had that assurance. But they still had to wander. Their disobedience had resulted in a death march, basically. God provided for them every day. Their clothes never wore out. Their shoes never wore out. They had food to eat every single day. He took care of them. But they still weren't going to be the ones going in. The people had learned what it meant to be fully reliant on God. And I think that that's something that we don't get today. We don't understand what it means, I think, a lot of cases to be fully reliant on God. We try to do things in our own strength and our own power. We try to do things uh, my way. We try to do things the way I want it done. But God has something that is telling us we need to be fully reliant on him. And that's what they learn on this journey. Nothing in their own strength could push past that. God had a plan for them and they were going to have to live it out. They truly knew what it meant when they heard that phrase, number our days. And as we get into the word today, we're going to look at a few things. And I mentioned them just a minute ago, but we're going to look at how timeless God really is. You see, we have a, 
we have trouble understanding that. I think a lot of times we have trouble comprehending it. It says there that he's been our dwelling place for all generations before the mountains were brought forth, the earth was formed and the world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. God has always been. And we try to comprehend that with our, with our tiny little brains. Some of us have smaller brains than others. <laughs> the average human brain uh, weighs about three pounds. And they say that we use about 10% of our brain capacity, which narrows that down to about 4.8 ounces. When I think about that, and you all know me, I, I think kind of weird sometimes. We try to figure out the mysteries of the universe with a quarter pounder with cheese is what we're trying to do. I mean, that's it. We try to figure out everything about God with just a little bit of brain power. And we're never gonna understand it. We, we, we can't understand that time means nothing to God. A.W. Tozer said it this way, with God, Abram's day and this day, are the same. It doesn't mean a difference to him, whether it was 5,000 years ago or today. To God, time doesn't matter. We're all governed by time. I mean, everything that we do is governed by time. Right before church started, I was talking with someone and they said, oh, you got a minute and 29 seconds. And I turned around and looked, I said, yeah, I do. <laughs> the timer was ticking down. I said, well, I guess I better sit down and behave the best I can which I didn't. But we determine when it's time to go to work by time. We determine when it's time to eat by looking at the clock on the wall. We determine when it's time to go to bed by looking at the clock. I tell people all the time, I remember when I was young, I used to think, man, I can't wait till I grow up and can stay up as late as I want. I found out as late as I want is 9.30. <laughs> If I stay up past that, uh, I'm useless the next day. But we're governed by time, but God isn't. And that's so cool. But we can try to figure it out. In uh, Psalms 9, it says a thousand years is in your sight is like yesterday when it's past, like a watch in the night. In 2 Peter, it says, don't forget this one thing, that with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. It doesn't matter to him. And the thing about it is, God has his timing. And I believe the last time I was here, I preached about trying to hurry God. And we do. We try to hurry him. We try to make him fit into our time schedule. And when it all boils down to it, we don't know what our schedule is. And we'll get into that in just a minute. We don't know how much time we have left. But we're trying to get God to fit into that little box. And he said, don't worry about it. I've got this. We'll do it in my time. You see, the reason God does that is because he realizes how frail we really are. He realizes that we're just dust when he looks at our frame. He looks at us and realizes that we couldn't comprehend everything that he has planned for us if he laid it all out at once. The Psalm that I started out with says the days of our lives are 70 years and by reason of strength they are 80. Yet the boast is only labor and sorrow and it's soon cut off and we fly away. 70 years. You know, when I was a kid, I thought 70, wow, that's a long time. Now that I'm 65 years old, 70 doesn't seem like very long at all. 80, I mean, that sounds really good to me. <laughs> I tell people all the time when, when I look at that scripture that anyone who gets past 80, it's a blessing that God has given them. It's something that he has for them to do. Some people live to be 70, some 80. Most of you know where I work. You know that I work for the funeral home and we've done funerals in the past week for people in their 20s, or past weeks, people in their 20s, all the way up to 94 years old. 
We don't know the schedule. We don't know the timing that is there, but we do know this, that one day that time is gonna end. And that's how we know how fragile we are. If you think about it, if someone lives to be 100 years old, what is that compared to 1,000 years? What's it compared when you look at all eternity? When you look at how God has always been and always will be, 100 years is nothing. James put it this way, that what is your life? It's only a vapor. It's here for a little while, and then it's gone. And I promise you, I'm not preaching a funeral sermon right now. <laughs> We're getting there. But I'm just showing you how frail we really are. We only have so many trips around the sun and then we're gone. The thing about it is, the scriptures ended that I read to start with, to teach us to number those days. Number the days that we have. And I believe what that is saying in my heart, that we need to make every day count. We need to make sure that every day that we are on this planet, we're making it count. There's a song that came out several years ago. The title of it was Live Like You Were Dying. Okay, I'm not a country fan, but I, I love this song. Uh, because it has a challenge in it. And the challenge is, and, and this is the challenge that I want to lay out to everybody. What if you found out today that you only had 30 days left to live? What would you do with those 30 days? What would you do if you knew that my time is that short and I've got to get things accomplished? Now, a lot of us would try to, to do things that are exciting. Uh, the guy in the song says that he went skydiving and Rocky Mountain climbing. Okay, I can do that. 2.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu? Eh, maybe. I don't think I can stay on it that long. But what it says after that is this, that he loved deeper. Is that what we would do? The people in our lives that we would love them like we've never loved before, that we would love them deeper than we have ever loved them, and spoke sweeter and gave forgiveness that I've been denying. Now you're probably glad I didn't sing that, but I wanna tell you, there's a lot of truth in that. If we knew that our days were numbered, if we knew that the time was getting short, is that what we would do? Or would we be out there skydiving and Rocky Mountain climbing and, and try to ride a bull? Or I believe that we need to look at the last part there and that's how we live our lives. I'm going to give you a couple examples that are found in the scriptures and two different outlooks on it. One was King Hezekiah. Way back in the book of 2 Kings, it says that Hezekiah was sick and he was sick to death. And the prophet came in and he said to him, get your house in order because you're going to die. You need to make sure you get everything in order. And Hezekiah it says he turns his face to the wall and he weeps. And then he starts praying. That's a good thing. He said, Lord, remember me. Remember what I've done. Now, Hezekiah had been a good dude. He, he'd done a good thing as a king there. But he said, Lord, remember me. Remember the, the things I've accomplished here. And he prayed for mercy. And before the prophet had left the, the palace, God told him, turn around, go back, tell him he's going to live. He had gotten a reprieve. He had received the news that he was going to die, but now he's getting a reprieve that he's going to live. And he's given another 15 years. In that 15 years, he didn't do what he should have done. He started heaping everything on himself. He started doing everything for me. He started doing everything to make sure that he was well taken care of. And he wasn't so, so concerned about everything else. He wasn't so concerned about the worship of Yahweh. He wasn't so concerned about the worship uh, that was going on in the temple. He was more so worried about, is everybody worshiping me? 
And in that time, he had a son named Manasseh, who at one point was the most wicked king Israel ever had. Towards the end of his life, he repented. But up until that point, he was the most wicked king. He had learned well from his dad. It's all about me. It's all about what I can get. It's all about what everyone can do for me. See, Hezekiah wasted the reprieve. He wasted the time that he had. Then you have the Apostle Paul. In 2 Timothy, it says this, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. Paul was under a death sentence. He knew he was going to die. He knew he wasn't going to walk out of where he was at. He knew that the only time he was going to leave there was for his execution. So what did he do? I mean, think about it. If you were in that situation, would you sit there and feel sorry for yourself? Would you sit there and, and, and cry and pray and, and do all this stuff? Paul preached the whole time that he was under this death sentence. He made sure that anyone who came into that door, anyone who had, had ears to listen, he would tell them about Jesus. He would tell them about what he's done for him and how he's waiting to see him. He had this thing in his heart that he knew, just like we sang earlier, ain't no grave going to hold him down. He wasn't going to be held down. He knew he was going to be good. He was, no matter what happened to him, he knew that as soon as he was absent from the body, he was going to be present with the Lord. So he just kept on preaching. And that's what I believe that all of us need to have that attitude. Oh, Paul, he knew he was going to live forever. Paul knew that no matter what happened to him, he wanted somebody to know about Jesus. Is that how we feel? That we want everybody that we come in contact with to know about Jesus. Because that's what we should do. Paul lived for two whole years in a rented house and received all who came to him in Acts 28, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord. Jesus Christ with all confidence and no one was forbidding him. So how are we going to number our days? How are we going to live them out? Are we going to live them out in submission to God? Because one day we are going to stand before him. One day we will be standing in judgment. It says it's appointed unto man once to die in the book of Hebrews. And but after that, the judgment. The question is, how are we going to be judged? Are we going to be judged from the things that we did that were everlasting, the things that we did for Christ? In 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote these words. He said, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold and silver and precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. The wood, hay, and straw, it's going to burn up. The precious stones, the gold, the silver, it's just going to get finer. The test is going to be there. What are we doing with our lives? What are we doing with the days that we have here on this earth? Every single one of us, and I know that sometimes we think, oh, you don't know how busy I am. You don't know what's going on. You don't know what, what's happening in my life. I got this going on. I got that going on. Every single one of us have 525,600 minutes in a year. What do we do with each minute? What do we do with that time? Now, I know we got to sleep. I used to say sleep was overrated, but now it's not. <laughs> I used to think that I could go two or three days and no, no problem, with no sleep. That ain't happening no more. We have this time and we need to submit to God because we know that one day we will stand before him. 
Teach us to number our days, Lord, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days, Lord, so that we are doing the things that you've called us to do. We need to be faithful with what he's allowed us. We have to make sure, as it says in Colossians, to be wise in the way we act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Every opportunity, not just, you know, every now and then tell somebody about Jesus, but every opportunity that we have, we need to be doing this. Because we don't know how much longer we have. In Ephesians, it says this, be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. We don't know how many more days we have, but we gotta make them count. I said earlier that this message has really been resounding with me for the last couple weeks. You see, a couple weeks ago, I found out something. And uh, I haven't told a lot of people. Well, I guess I did. Facebook knows, so everybody knows. But if you don't have Facebook, a couple weeks ago, I got diagnosed with non-alcoholic, which is good, uh, fatty liver disease. There are three outcomes for fatty liver, the fatty liver disease that I have. None of them are, are good. One is cirrhosis, the other is liver cancer, and the third, the only cure for it, is a transplant. Now I'm 65 years old. They gonna give a liver to an old man, not when there's young kids who need one. But I know this, and I talked with my pastor about it this morning, I told him, I said, I'm going to preach until I can't. And then I'm going to do one more. I'm going to preach till I can't, and then I'm going to stand up and preach one more time. Because I want to make sure that every day counts. I want to make sure that I'm not wasting my time. I'm not going to be like Hezekiah and think, well, it's over. I'm just going to kick back, and I'm going to go on vacation. Can't do it. You see, Jeremiah put it this way, that he tried to be quiet about God. He tried not to say anything, but it was like fire in his bones and he couldn't contain himself and he had to do it. That's the way we should approach every single day of our life. That's the way we should approach, that we have that death sentence because each and every one of us, unless the Lord comes and that trumpet sounds, each and every one of us will go by the way of the grave. And we don't know when. You been out on the interstate lately? Them folks drive crazy out there. People on 40 don't drive any better. The day can come in a moment. That time when you're standing in front of Jesus face to face. I'm looking forward to that day. Do I want it to come soon? Not really. I'd like to stick around. And maybe that's selfish because I look at it this way. What I've got right now cannot compare to what's ahead. But I want to make sure what I have right now, make sure that I get to what's ahead. I don't want to back down. I don't want to back up. I don't want to shut up. I want to keep preaching. But it's not about me. You see, this message, although it is for me, it's for you too. And I want every one of you today to have that attitude. That you would have that attitude that I'm going to preach until I can't and then do one more. I want you to keep doing that every single day. Now you may not stand up here in the pulpit and preach, but you got family and friends that need to hear about Jesus. 
You know people that are lost right now that are going to a devil's hell and there's nothing between them and hell except your testimony maybe. Pointing them to the one who can save them. Pointing them to the one who can say, I receive you to myself. Pointing the one to the one that said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. That Apostle Paul said that we couldn't imagine how good it is. That the book of Revelation says that there's no crying, no tear, and no pain. Could you imagine a day without pain? I told my wife a long time ago, if I ever woke up and wasn't hurting, I figured I was dead. <laughs> but that day is coming. Is it tomorrow? I don't know. Is it 10 years from now? I don't know. All I know is that I'm scheduled to preach all the way through January somewhere. It'd be good to be able to fulfill that. I don't think it's going to be that quick. I don't think. Okay, they told me if I changed my diet, I could prolong things. But they said I got to cut out red meat. That ain't happening. Pasta. You can't have that. So last night I had beef stroganoff, noodles and beef. <laughs> Okay, I'm not going to hurry it along. But I can't give up ribeyes. I want to trust that God is going to take care of everything that happens. And like the song says, when the day comes, ain't no grave going to hold this body down. Ain't no grave. Can y'all say that? I hope you can say it with truth <laughs> and honesty in your heart that you know for certain that when you are laid to rest and that trumpet sounds, you're coming up out of the ground. Here's the thing. I work for a funeral home and I spend a lot of time in cemeteries. I never stand on a grave out there. It's kind of a respect thing, but also, I don't know if that person saved that I'm standing on or not. And if that trumpet sounds while I'm standing there in the cemetery, I don't want them shooting through me. <laughs> I don't want to hinder them because I'm going next. But if I slow them down, I got to wait. So I don't stand on graves. Number your days. And here's the cool thing. We're going to close this thing out. This is the cool thing about it. If you haven't made every day count up till now, that's okay. Because now you can. From this moment on, you can. You can say in your heart, you can pray, you can tell God, I'm going to make every day count now, Lord. I want to make sure that people know about Jesus. I want to make sure people know that he is the only way to get to you. And live out that life, however long it is, serving him every single day. <laughs> spending time in the word, spending time in prayer, but spending time in service of the Lord. Because when it all said and done, that's the only thing that's going to last. So how many days do we have left? I don't know. But I believe that if we number them in service of the, to the master, it's going to be pleasing to God. And one day, we'll hear those words that every Christian is longing to hear. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Come on in. Let's stand. Lord, this has been tough. But I'll tell you this, Lord, I thank you for this word. I thank you for the promise that is there. I thank you, Lord, that no matter what, 
no matter what, you're here with us. You're always going to be with us. You're going to stand with us no matter what we go through. So Lord, teach us to number our days. Teach us to be able to gain that heart of wisdom. Teach us to be able to do, Lord, the things that you've called us to do. Don't let us waste another minute, Lord. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name. Amen.